when I first got interested in nutrition, fat free everything. Mm -hmm. That was the way. Fat was the enemy. Fat that you eat was fat on your body. That was the idea. Don't eat fat. I mean, I'm eating at this time, 16 years old, I'm eating pasta with like no oil and, you know, just carb loading all day because that's what you do. That's healthy eating. Then I watched no fat go to no carbs. I've watched it go high protein. I've watched low protein. This is stuff gets really confusing because just note that if you, and I'll let you jump in here in a second, but I just want to point out, if you listened to everybody, you've got the people who say you shouldn't eat fat. You got the people who say you shouldn't eat too much protein. You've got the people who say you shouldn't eat too much carbs. And you got the people who say you shouldn't drink alcohol. Well, newsflash, there's only four places we get calories from. We get them from carbs, fat, protein, and alcohol. Hey, this is Ari. Welcome back to the show. In this episode, I am speaking with Daniel Vitalis, who is a man that I've wanted to speak to for a very long time, who is someone that uh, I've been following for many, many years, well over 10 years. And I've always loved his style of thinking, the way that he thinks about and speaks about and teaches human health. I think he has um, a very original take on things. And I think he's, he's always got novel insights. He's just an original thinker. The way his brain operates and his ability to communicate things is very special. I think he's an amazing, brilliant guy. And uh, I was really looking forward to this conversation. This is someone I've, I've wanted to speak to for many years. So uh, a bit about him. He is the host of Wild Fed on Outdoor Channel. Uh, this is a TV show on Outdoor Channel. And for 10 years, he lectured around North America and abroad, offering workshops that helped others lead healthier and nature-integrated lives. He's a successful entrepreneur. He founded the nutritional company Sir Thrival in 2008. And most recently, he hosted the popular podcast Rewild Yourself. He's a registered Maine guide writer, public speaker, interviewer, and lifestyle pioneer who's especially interested in helping people reconnect with wildness both inside and outside of themselves. After learning to hunt, fish, and forage as an adult, he created WildFed to inspire others to start a wild food journey of their own. Headquartered in the Lakes region of Maine, he lives with his beautiful wife, Avani, and their plot hound, Ellie. You can connect with him at wildfed.com. It's wild-fed.com and on Instagram at Daniel Vitalis and on Facebook. With no further ado, enjoy this conversation with Daniel Vitalis. It was one of my personal favorites and I enjoyed talking to him very much. And every time I listen to him, I always get unique insights. So with no further ado, enjoy the brilliant Daniel Vitalis. So welcome everybody to the Energy Blueprint podcast. I am super excited for today's guest. It is not often that I can say that I'm a true fan of somebody's work that I get to interview on this podcast, but this is somebody that uh, I've been following for over a decade. I wanna say closer to 15 years, but I don't know exactly. Um, I can recall a time a decade ago where my wife and I were listening to podcasts uh, from this guy uh, while driving across the country and really enjoying his podcast and dreaming one day of maybe I would have a conversation with him on my podcast. And here we are a decade plus later, and uh, I've, I've really enjoyed his work. And what's, what's amazing is that I have followed this person. His name is Daniel Vitalis for such a long time that during this time he's made a transition from a vegan superfood guru to a modern day hunter gatherer <laughs> and uh, along the way there's been an enormous amount of insights and he's one of the most intelligent eloquent and articulate uh, communicators and teachers of human health and the human experience and sort of the human place in nature that that i've ever experienced and so again someone that I'm a true fan of, Daniel Vitalis. Welcome to the show. Hey, wow. Thank you. That's uh, incredible to hear all that. And um, I hope I live up to it today, but I appreciate <laughs> you sharing my, my voice with your audience. Yeah. So first of all, let me have you tell your story to, to people who are not familiar with you and the fact that you've transitioned from, I, I mean, I remember watching videos, buying like a course from you where it was you and David Wolf, like teaching 
uh, you know, how to make these like raw vegan super food elixirs and stuff like that. And um, over those years, as, as I've said, now you're you're doing TV shows where you're basically a hunter gatherer and you're showing your your hunting and foraging and creating foods from from, you know, this whole process of of being a modern day gun, hunter gatherer. Um, what is that? How, how would you tell that story to people who have never experienced your work? Yeah, it sounds a little like a, a big radical change when you lay it out that way, but the ex experientially for me, it's been like a pretty steady continuity um, mm -hmm. because my interest has been in nutrition for a really long time. I'm really interested in human health in general, but I've had a special interest in food and when I say nutrition, I guess I think I bring a somewhat different perspective than we typically hear from the nutrition folks. Um, I look at it a little bit differently, which we'll get into. But uh, all that really stems back to my childhood, which was just not a, a really supportive one. And um, I really had to kind of figure out how to take care of myself as a young person. And so food became an interest, a central interest of mine, just out of you know necessity. And uh, when I was a teenager, I really threw myself into it deeply. This was the era of uh, cassette tapes, I guess, because I think back to that time in my life, listening to a lot of um, kind of Tony Robbins type, you know, self-help kind of, I think it was called at the time. And I loved listening to the way these people communicated knowledge. And so um, I ended up kind of following in that that path as, you know, I think somebody like Tony Robbins back in the day, you know, the fact that he was able to get himself out onto the national stage is pretty amazing. Today, things are a lot easier. So um, thinking back, like you said, to my podcast, you know, 10 years ago, it was like an early days of podcasting, mm -hmm. you know, it was, um, I didn't realize what it was going to become. I thought it was kind of a gimmicky thing, but I started doing it. Uh, not really understanding that I would chart my own personal journey. So, so basically um, I started, like you mentioned in the raw food, vegan world. Um, I was just kind of a fixture in that community. I was at a lot of the events. Uh, so I just started off as a consumer of that information on my own personal journey. Uh, but before I knew it, I was working at the events and the retreats. And pretty soon I was speaking at those events and then eventually headlining my own events. And I got to travel all around North America, which was pretty awesome. Canada and the US, you know, public speaking. I got to do some international stuff doing that as well. But um, Actually, the truth of it is by the time I was public speaking, I was not a vegan anymore. So I was in that community still, but I had been massively influenced by um, the book Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, mm -hmm. um, which uh, you know really detailed hunter-gatherer diets around the world and the way that the departure from that diet impacted dentition in particular. But, um, you know, also Weston Price, the author was a dentist. So he went around the world to look at people's teeth and he was asking himself why we had cavities, which when you think about it are a bone disease, you know, our teeth are bones. And so cavities are something like osteoporosis of the teeth. And it's interesting to this day, we don't spend a lot of time asking ourselves why this happens. We spend a lot of time treating it. And so he was wondering, hey, why is this happening? He starts going around the world and realizes there'd been this global departure from traditional diets. And in particular, he was looking at indigenous diets and he, you know, that was the first time I really, it clicked for me. It's embarrassing to talk about a little bit because I had this very naive view of human beings in a kind of garden of Eden, just living off of fruits and, you know, nothing has to die and they don't, you know, have to grow anything because it's all available there in nature. That was sort of my idea of what the natural world was like. And I didn't really understand the field of anthropology, how developed it was and what was really understood in the literature. This is pre early days of the internet, not pre internet, but it was pre social media, pre cell phones. You know, I mean, this stuff wasn't really happening yet. This is before the iPhone. So information was not as widely available. I just didn't really understand. Um, that book opened my eyes and I got really interested in looking at, well, what do people actually eat pre-agriculturally um, for the last, now we'd say, you know, at that time we would have said 200,000 years. Now we'll say 300,000 years. We know we've been around a lot longer. New discoveries happen all the time and push our dates back. But but I was thinking, wait a second, you know, we've, we've been here 300,000 years and agriculture's 10, 12, 13,000 years old. What was our diet? And it turns out universally, 
we are omnivores and we've always been omnivores. Um, so I, I do like to kind of poke at both sides. It's kind of like our politics in the United States now, you know, it's very divided, yeah. sort of like that. But we have a left wing and a right wing. We say the left wing is like the vegans and the right wing is like the carnivore diet people. And both have created caricatures of our diet, yes. of our natural diet separated them in in the same way that I think a lot of us are coming around to realizing that we hold views that some could be called conservative, some could be called liberal or progressive ideas. And most of us don't actually align perfectly with a party. We have a mix of ideas. Well, you know, similarly, like our Ho diet is a mix hopefully. of- yeah, hopefully, hopefully we don't align perfectly with any, right. <laughs> like we don't right. let a party, a political party right. do all of our thinking for us. And, and similarly right. with dietary ideologies. Yet, like you're kind of hinting at there with that, you know, kind of astute comment, it's it's happening in the diet world where people do fully align themselves as vegans or fully align themselves as carnivores. And that's a very predictable path. And I'll talk about it because I was on it. Um, what happens is you you start off feeling amazing because you've made a big dietary change. And that usually leads to some pretty cool results initially. Um you're very excited because you're part of a new community and both the carnivore diet and the vegan side, they both kind of share, they're actually like opposites. They have the same idea. The idea is something like this. Again, I say this from having been in one of these cults. Um, the belief is something like all of humanity has forgotten this core principle. And when we aligned with this core principle, it was utopia. There was no disease, no sickness, no degeneration, no sinensis. Like we didn't have to, sorry, sinesis, sinensis, sinescence. Senescence? Senescence. Sinensis is uh, the all the, the plants that come from China. You know, it's the it's the uh, Latin uh, binomial for them. Uh, sorry, that was, was my uh, where my my brain went to uh, psilocybin uh, sinescence. Uh, Sinet, yeah, sinensis would be like a plant that comes from Asia. Anyway, so um, the idea that we didn't have to age the way we do and degenerate the way we do. So uh, both sides kind of believe that, that they've they've uh, found the hidden secret, right? And so that's very exciting. And that will carry you a while too. You have a lot of momentum with that. Then eventually health issues start creeping in because it's a very extreme diet. Of course, your body's not really set up for this diet. So then there starts to be breakdown. But what happens is now you bump into your own identity politic because you've identified yourself to the point you've kind of lost who you are and your identity is in the diet. And that's the real danger zone because people will stick that out a long time, depending on how hard headed they are. Yeah. I was real hard headed. So, you know, I did this for a decade and uh, it took me a long time to kind of realize once I did I sort of transitioned back to omnivory. Um, I really got interested in the idea of wild food because I kept thinking when we go into the supermarket and we look around at what we should eat, and of course we hear all the time, like, we'll stick to the outsides of the supermarket because that's where the most intact whole foods are. And that's of course true. But what we never hear about is that those foods are all domesticated foods that have been drawn out of the wild natural world. And so we have in the last, let's We'll we'll be we'll get wild and crazy and say fourteen thousand years, you know, somewhere ten to fourteen thousand years ago, people started to, and this happened independently around the world, several different domestication centers. We figured out how to turn, you know, the aurochs into a cow, and we figured out how to turn, you know, the wild prickly lettuce into the modern day lettuce. Like, you know, this initially probably started with wheat and barley, you know, rice. It actually starts with the grains typically, but we learned how to domesticate these plants. So now when we're in the supermarket and we see all these foods and we we go, what is the best diet? Which in other words, is, it's like a way of saying, what's the best arrangement of these supermarket foods for me? Mm -hmm. And we don't realize, wait, none of these foods existed 10,000 years ago, not a single one. So is there an ideal arrangement of these foods if they're all novel? And when we look back, we see that all around the world, the healthiest people ever, the indigenous peoples of the world were living off of wild foods and they weren't these foods in our supermarkets. So trying to reconstruct a really natural diet for ourselves can is actually not really possible with the suite of foods we have available. So I got really fascinated by that idea, started to forage more seriously, working with herbs and working with you know, the wild edibles that I could find. And that eventually led me to learn to hunt as well. And um, 
I guess I just took it a little bit further than the average person wants to go in seeking out like what's a more natural diet and that, you know, so today I'm really blessed to have a television show. We're going into our fourth season of production. It's called wild fed. And, and in that show, we, we typically go out, get some plant or uh, fungi or algae or something like that. And then we'll go get some animal, whether we hunt it or fish it or trap it. And then we'll bring that together for a meal. And um, I guess that's my continued exploration of this idea um, but also my way of sharing that with, with folks as well, the sort of fruits of my journey. Mm -hmm. Man, I, I want to talk to you for like four hours. Cause there's so many questions that I think would be wonderful to get into with you. But, um, you mentioned Weston A. Price's book as, as sort of an early source of inspiration yeah. for you. I'm curious if you've expo explored modern day hunter gatherer diets at all, and, uh, maybe Stefan Lindeberg's work. Uh, who is a modern day researcher who is who's gone over traveled a lot uh, all over the world and looked at modern day hunter gatherers in Africa and South America and the South Pacific and sort of um, scientifically cataloged the 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 nutrient breakdown and the specific foods that people are eating and have you have you spent time in different I'm not familiar gatherers? with that body of work no oh I'm you'd love really it interested in that yeah you, oh, no, you'd no, love no, it all I'll, I'll link you to it but please do yeah um I'm spacing on the name of the, he wrote a textbook. He's a, he's a formal researcher who specialized in that and cataloged modern day hunter gatherer wow. diets. Stefan Lindeberg. Lindeberg. I'm sure I've come across some of his work, maybe not realizing reading studies, but I, you know, if yeah. it's, if it's collected somewhere, I would love to, to yeah. see the books. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great textbook. Um, okay. have you spent time looking at modern day hunter gatherer diets or spending time with modern day hunter gatherers and, and, have you gleaned any insights from looking at how they eat or how they live? My looking at that for me has been academic, not, you know, uh, anthropological. So I haven't like gone, you know, I have, yes, I've been to the Amazon and I have spent time, but very, very surface level. I don't want to give the impression that I've been doing anthropological work anywhere. Um, most of what I've been interested in is actually practical application here. So the question for me has been like, what does it look like for a person who lives in a house, who drives a car, who pays taxes to approach the wild world as a supermarket? Mm -hmm. um, so that's been my primary interest. I, I have noticed in the academia, you tend to have a separation between the observer and the application. Mm -hmm. So you'll yeah. very often have fantastic observers but they very rarely go like, what would it look like for me to immerse myself in it? Mm -hmm. So they give us these great body of work, but typically don't do the experiments. It's the same in archaeology. Like there's the idea of primitive skills that sometimes it's called applied archaeology. And folks will be like, well, you know, the, the archaeologist will come up with theories of how a stone was napped. And the primitive skills practitioner will go like, well, I'm going to try it and see if we can actually replicate that stone point. And that leads to greater revelations very often than the academia is able to generate simply because there's whatever, for whatever reason, a disconnect. I think because most, most of the time the researchers are so inculcated in the lifestyle and there's like a, not, not even like, there's a strong taboo against anything that doesn't support our civilization and its doctrine. So it's very hard for people to imagine. What happens is we look at this as primitive. We look at it as backwards. We look at it as a relic. We look at it as something beneath us. And we look at ourselves as hierarchically the top of the pyramid, those who have left behind and shed all of that nature stuff to move into the built environment. And we see ourselves as the most technologically advanced. And so it's very difficult for people to embrace that. We have terms for it, like so-and-so has gone native, we'll say, you know, like uh, derogatory ways of talking about it. I wrote a lot about this uh, several years ago. I called it the intrinsic taboo, which is the taboo against wildness. Um, so unfortunately, most of the people who do the research, you know, are master's PhDs, they're deeply inculcated in our way of life. And so they simply go to these people kind of like you might observe an ant farm. Mm. Um, and nobody ever thinks I'm going to go live in the ant farm, you know? So um, I do see that has been one of the things that's really helped people back. Very, very few of the researchers are interested in, I guess, what we might call biohacking the actual themselves, you know? And with that in mind, you, you, were, you were one of 
very few humans who have grown, grown up in a Western context who are now engaged in a hunter gatherer lifestyle. I mean, <laughs> there, there's gotta be very few humans on planet earth who are doing what you're doing right now. Rel relatively. Yeah. And I'd say we all have it. Those of us who are interested in it do it different ways. I mean, there's a lot of people who hunt, but I do know that most of those folks don't really have the botany skills to forage. Yeah. And there's a lot of folks that forage and very few of them seem to have the hunting skills. Of course, there's lots of those folks and a lot of them are deeper and better at it than I am. But, um, but there's also a lot compared to the average hunter, what you're doing mm -hmm. is philosophically and intellectually yeah. much, much more sophisticated. Like there, there's a lot of layers beneath the surface of yeah. what you're doing in, in that engaged in that activity of hunting that are very, that, you know, have many, many years of being well thought out. It's not just like, Hey, it would be fun to go, you know, hang out and, you know, shoot yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not yeah. to be mean with stereotypes there, but, um, what, what I want to ask you is this, like, if we look in an evolutionary context, um, if we look at other animal species, even what most other animal species are engaged in is essentially activities of daily survival, acquiring food and water. And there, there isn't much going on beyond acquiring the one, you know, the, 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 the things that are needed to stay alive and survive yeah, and, and food, reproduce. Yeah. Yeah. And food being very central to that. Yeah. Um, and if we look at ancient humans and hunter gatherers, that's very central. Like when, if you go on YouTube and you watch videos of hunter gatherer tribes, for example, the Hadza tribe and in Tanzania and Africa, um, and sometimes Westerners go there and spend time there and they'll ask them questions like, um, what is how many the... genders are there? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, that's certainly a useful question to ask. I agree. I've seen uh, the videos of that. But let, let's not answer that so we don't anger people. Um, but more like what is the meaning of life or mm -hmm. what, what brings you happiness? And they'll say things like a successful meat. hunt, you know, bringing yeah. home, bringing home meat to my family. Like, yeah. and you know, there's a whole discussion to be had around how simple their version of happiness is in the meaning of life relative to modern humans, where it's seemingly endlessly complex. But my, my point is their, their activities of daily life were very much it, it, like other animal species. It was about acquiring food and staying alive. And then there was a transition in, in human history towards we had the agricultural revolution, we had the industrial revolution, and all of this stuff uh, freed humans from having to be engaged every day in just surviving and acquiring food. And all of a sudden humans got to go into other activities. It, it freed up our time for doing other things, including leisure activities. And, um, and now humans are, modern humans, modern humans in the Western world are basically totally disconnected from the ancient human hunter gatherer way of life that is about acquiring food and surviving. And um, you have in that context now made a transition back to spending most of your time in the hunter gatherer way of life. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you have any insights around that that whole trend and the fact that most humans are so disconnected from that way of life that is what humans did and what, for most of human evolution and what basically all other animal species do. It, I'd like to, I'd like to answer that question and it's very difficult for me to jump ahead because there's some things I, it's hard for me about some of what you just said, because just because I want to note that hunter gatherers, do work a lot less than the average modern American does. Maybe not the average Amer modern American in 2023, because I think that's changed in the last three years or so, like how much people are working. But, but typically, you know, if we think, you know, someone like yourself who starts a business, you know, you're starting that business, you're working 60, 70 hours a week in the beginning, you know, 40 hour work week is, is 
standard, let's say that's more work time than the hunter gatherers putting in hunter gatherers did generate a lot of leisure. This, this varies depending on where they live and how much food abundance. It's unfortunate that we always have to reference Tanzania and the Hadza because they're just one of the last remaining groups. Mm -hmm. As you know, you can go book a tourist trip to spend time with them, which means, you know, they're smoking ganja, they're smoking tobacco, they're heavily influenced by Western culture today. This is not, there are very few remaining really true hunter gatherer people living their traditional life way today. So we have to keep kind of keep looking at the same groups, but um, keep in mind the rich storytelling cultures. Um, the, uh, you know, you look at North America, it was, it was, um, the, the amount of secret societies that existed amongst Native Americans here to carry these wisdom traditions forward. I mean, it wasn't just surviving. Human beings, at least for the last 50,000 years, had developed significant art and culture because there was quite a bit of leisure time. But um, as things, time started to be freed up, it's important to understand that with the origins of agriculture, you could very quickly get a slave caste. This is something that doesn't really exist in the hunting gathering world. So you really quickly end up with an elite ruling caste and the people who are doing the labor. Um, because sir, as you meant, you're sort of hinting at surplus food gets generated. That gets overseen by one group, enforced by another group, and the work is done by yet a third group at the base of that so kind of pyramid. Mm -hmm. um, and that becomes 10,000 years of really horrific human history. Mm -hmm. Very very awful human history because of um, the vast gap between the elites and the people who are doing the work. So I just think that needs to get said. But essentially, if we get to the heart of what you're saying is, yeah, we've got a lot more leisure time because we're not really spending time on the food stuff. In fact, I like to point out to people because when we hear the term processed food, um, you've probably heard me talk about this before, but but it, you know, processed food, just immediate negative for people. But when you're a forager or you're a hunter and you come home with anything from mushrooms to fiddleheads to a deer, you've got a significant amount of processing you have to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might think something simple as like a cranberry. Let's just say that. Like I go out to cranberry bogs in the fall. My wife and I harvest cranberries. You get those home and you think, oh, well, what processing do they really need? Well, every one we bring home has a little stem on it. And before I cook those into cranberry sauce, I got to go through each one and pull that little stem off. If I come home with, you know, a couple bushels of blueberries, it's a lot of leaves and sticks and twigs are mixed in there. Now, if you went to the frozen food department of your supermarket and bought a bag of blueberries, got it home and there was leaves and twigs in there, you know, you'd be pretty annoyed by that. You'd be paying for that by weight. So that has to get processed out, you know, winnowed away. So um, similarly, you don't go buy a, you know, a, a leg of a cow still got hair on it from the butcher shop that gets processed for you. So there was a period of time where processed foods, which really are a product of industrialization, industrialization led to processed foods, which freed people up from most of the labor. The labor is actually not as much in the harvesting usually as it is in the processing. So it's like, hey man, it's not a big deal to go out and pick a bunch of apples. It is a bigger deal to get all those apples home, peel every single apple, cut away the core, process that into applesauce, can it so that you have preserved applesauce. That's a bigger thing. So uh, probably nowhere easier to, to imagine this than with wheat. Just imagine what it takes to get from a, you know, a grain of wheat to flour. This is a lot of processing. A lot of human, a lot of the things we've carried forward into our built environment probably come from that. Music, I think most certainly came from processing. So picture... 40 of us sitting around campfires, not one, but multiple fires. And the women are grinding on a matate, the corn. Mm. And they fall into rhythm. And somebody else is cracking nuts over here. <laughs> and pretty soon the place falls into rhythm and music emerges from that, mm -hmm. right? The babies in the wombs are hearing these sounds of the processing and they come out and they quickly pick up the rhythms. And this is like probably the origin of most of our communication actually. Mm -hmm. So processing has been 
the main work that we have done for a really long time. And now we're not doing that because we have processed foods, which means we have very idle hands, gives us a lot of time to do a lot of other things. Uh, so that's one insight I would point out is that um, when you see somebody trying to, who's bored, it's because they're not processing food anymore, you know, <laughs> that, that's kind of, um, that is sort of central to what we've always done. Yeah. Um, another thing I'd point out is the, um, that exercise was sort of built into all of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I spend a tremendous amount of time. I mean, I, very kindly, you keep calling me a hunter gatherer, but really my life is not defined by that. I would say that that's, you know, a hobby of mine, but really, you know, I live in a house, I have dogs, I have a wife, I have work, I'm, I have companies, I make a TV show. Um, I'm in hotels a lot. I, I am spending more time not hunting and gathering than I am hunting and gathering. So I have to replicate all of that exercise that would have been built into my life way. Mm -hmm. So here we are now degenerating away from a lack of cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory exercise, you know, whether it's like the steady state stuff that you just get from moving camp constantly, walking constantly to maybe that more zone two stuff, like I'm running down an animal because we were persistence hunters to maybe that zone five stuff where it's like, I got to bust a move here and get on top of this kudu or whatever it is that yeah. we're running down the swimming, the diving, like there's just all this activity that now we have to replicate and we call it recreation. So here's another insight. Recreation is obviously just simply the word recreation. And it means to recreate something that we used to do. So when we find ourselves recreating what we're doing is just trying we are a hamster on a wheel trying to recreate like the hamster lives in the tank now in the cage so he doesn't get all that exercise he needs so you put the wheel in there so he can get that exercise and you're, he's recreating so that's what we're doing you know and, and and then turns out we need a lot of it a tremendous amount i mean you probably can't overstate how much we need I mean, it's just crazy as the evidence emerges more and more. It's like, oh, you basically can't overdo exercise. I mean, you got to make sure you do recovery, but you can't overdo it. You need a lot. And so a lot you of just like imagine low to moderate effort stuff. Yeah. Like humans and some are high designed for stuff. almost like constant low to moderate effort movement. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of that zone two type work is really, really important, but then you also need that high effort stuff occasionally a few times a week. And then, you know, you need mobility because we sit in chairs now instead of sitting on the ground the way we did. And so all, all this stuff, you know, building fires, collecting firewood, all this stuff, climbing for honey, infinite amount of work that's now being done by paid laborers and increasingly machines and that means then we have to go out and recreate. So that's another thing to consider. Um, and one other insight, I think for me, um, because I'm kind of coming to toward the end of a 10 year cycle of doing this and um, I'm really reflecting back, like what have I learned? And I think the biggest insight and takeaway for me has been this overlooked aspect of nutrition that, uh, you know, when I when I was growing up, nutrition was macronutrients. That was the big focus. And I watched sort of the revel, the, the revolution around micronutrients. And then I watched the revolution around phytonutrients. And I think we're probably just on the cusp of nutrigenomics really becoming a bigger field. Mm -hmm. So just in my lifetime, Here's, and here's, a, let me give another vicissitude that I think is important to note because everybody can connect to this who's maybe unless they're like a Gen Zer and then they'll see their own version of this as time goes on. But but I, I grew up, when I first got interested in nutrition, fat-free everything. Mm -hmm. That was the way. Fat was the enemy. Fat that you eat was fat on your body. That was the idea. Don't eat fat. I mean, I'm eating, at this time, 16 years old, I'm eating pasta with like no oil and, you know, just carb loading all day because that's what you do. That's healthy eating. Then I watched no fat go to no carbs. I've watched it go high protein. I've watched low protein. This is stuff gets really confusing because just note that if you, 
and I'll let you jump in here in a second, but I just want to point out if you listened to everybody, you've got the people who say you shouldn't eat fat. You got the people who say you shouldn't eat too much protein. You've got the people who say you shouldn't eat too much carbs. And you got the people who say you shouldn't drink alcohol. Well, newsflash, there's only four places we get calories from. We get them from carbs, fat, protein, and alcohol. And you have to get something like, if you're doing that amount of exercise we're talking about, what do you think? Maybe close to 3,000 calories a day if you're just moderately training. Mm -hmm. So where's that energy going to come from? It's got to come from one of those macronutrients. So I really believe similar to what I was saying about, I think that the vegans are way too far on one side. And I think the the carnivore people, and paleo people are too far on the other side. Similarly, you make amylase in your mouth to break down carbohydrates as soon as you start chewing them for a reason. You have lipase to digest lipids, fats, for a reason. You need protein. I think we'll probably come to the realization that we're currently currently overstating the protein need. I think we're, if you follow the current, let's, what, what would you say the current fitness trend is probably one gram of protein per pound of body weight right now? Yeah. Or, the average person or, or, or will find, and then for a bodybuilder, they're going to go to point six, point six to one, depending on who you. Okay. Talk to. Point six is easy. One, I like to shoot for a gram a day because that's the current recommendation, but not always easy to hit that. You find yourself really having a push to get all of that sometimes, you know? depending on how much meat you like to eat. So it's interesting. We're now we're in a high protein phase, but you definitely need protein. And ethanol is obviously somebody's personal decision. It's like, I used to drink it. I don't drink it now. Um, but it's seven calories a gram. So there's a reason people can live off of booze because they can burn that as a dirty, dirty fuel. So um, I think we probably though could eat a nice balance like we like we used to a fat protein and carbohydrate this idea that you should eliminate any one of the macronutrients just doesn't make sense it's like eliminating a color out of the rainbow i don't really i don't really get that yeah and as you said we've had dietary camps that have demonized all of those things right carbs fats and proteins um and the one that i wanted to add to your list which is a new one relatively, is you, you mentioned earlier the, the, the phytochemical, uh, phytonutrient revolution, that it started to come into our awareness as a species that, hey, there's all these specific compounds in many different plants that have these beneficial health effects. Well, now what we're seeing is this carnivore diet camp that's emerging, saying things like plants are trying to kill you and oh, yeah. you know, animals, animals can run away from you. That's their defense mechanism. But plants don't have the ability to run away. And so they evolve yeah. these chemicals that are designed to be poisons and dissuade um, predators from, from eating them. And, and, and therefore, plants have chemicals chemicals are bad, they're poisons, and therefore plants are trying to kill you and you should avoid plants because they're unhealthy, um, which is obviously just contradicted by a mountain of, of evidence. Ob uh, an observable, yeah. observable reality. This is, yeah. my, this is what scares me the most about people today yeah. is their willingness to do the emperor wears no clothes thing where, yeah. where you override your own common sense yes. to go with this not even consensus reality. I mean, yeah. it's so obvious because here's one of the insights you get when you hunt and gather and things get very confused because people watch a lot. We consume a lot of survival television and what we're seeing is not realistic. So some people are hearing this and they're thinking, what if I found myself in Siberia with no clothes and no tools and I had to survive? It's like, well, People don't like to live in Siberia. They like to live on river floodplains. And that's why when you, and they like to live on the coast. So when you look at where hunter gatherers were, they were everywhere, but there's some hard scrabble places and there's some good places. And if you can, you live in places that aren't Northern coniferous forests where there's almost no food. There's very little to eat in those places. So when you watch a show like Alone, which I think is a really great show, actually, it's one, probably the only one I'd watch. It's really cool to watch that, but that's not a place where people were eking out survival, really. The other thing is people typically are in groups of 30 to 50 when they hunt and gather. That's like the typical foraging group size, about 30 people working together. 
And you would have been born into a culture that already had shoes for you and already had a backpack for you and already had a bowl for you and already all that. There was already a fire going like you didn't have to like figure it out. Suddenly you're fu suddenly naked in the woods. It doesn't work <laughs> like that. You're suddenly in a community that's been going for thousands of years, who knows how to do everything, who knows where everything is, who knows the seasons, who's already charted the equinoxes and solstices, who understands the stars, who understands north, south, east, west. I mean, very. it's a mistake to think of these people as unsophisticated. They're different, but not unsophisticated. The level of knowledge is, is startling at times. Mm -hmm. So that's a really uh, important piece as well. But um, very obvious to those people who were looking for calories all the time, as you mentioned before, that whatever you can render edible, you eat. Mm -hmm. The only reason you have a food you don't eat is because you revere it maybe. So you'd say, we don't eat, mm, we don't eat beaver because we understand that beaver are landscape level architects and their role in, in our environment is too important. So we don't eat those, but not because like meat's bad. That's just not a thing. Like this has never been a thing. You wouldn't be like, oh, this is too carby. I'm not going to eat this. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. Carby's good. Yeah, yeah exactly. Carby's good. Starch is good. Mm -hmm. Lipids are good. The problem that we have today is we have too much access, constant access, and without the processing that slows you down. So I can just reach into a bag of cashews and eat seven dozen at once because I don't have to crack through them right. and process them, which slows me down and I reach satiation long before right? Or that I know that cachet has to last my people through the season. So it would be a huge social taboo for me to have enough ego to think it's okay for me to just eat handfuls of those, right? It's like, that doesn't work like that. And we also know, I'm sure you've experienced this in your life. I know I have times of more exercise and times of less. What I notice is when I exercise less, I crave to eat more and I crave to eat worse. And when I exercise a lot, I have completely diminished sense of craving and I want to eat better. So you're talking about people who are on the move, on the go. It wasn't about sitting around eating all the time. And we have turned eating into a hobby and an entertainment source, which yeah. that's a really new thing too. So back in the day, calories were a good thing. The problem is we just have too many calories, too easily accessible without enough work. I mean, one of the things I try to remind people of is we hear a lot about how overpopulated the world is and that there's shortages of food everywhere. And I try to point out, well, what are the people who are hungry? What were they, what are their bodies made from? It's like, well, they're made from food. So can there really be a shortage of food if in those places they're continuing to reproduce and actually do so at a faster rate than in the West? Because it seems like they must have a surplus of food. You couldn't get a, a pop that's called carrying capacity. You couldn't get a population of animals to overpopulate if they were underfed. They have to have sufficient calories or they can't do that because their babies are ultimately made out of the food nutrients, particularly protein. I'm not saying there aren't people who are going hungry or places where food isn't distributed well. That's obviously real. But we have a massive oversupply of food in the world, and that's why our population is at 8 billion. And it'll keep growing as long as we keep producing surpluses of food. If we just said, okay, we're only going to produce this amount of food forever now, it's very obvious what would happen is our population would stabilize at this level. The only way it can increase is increased food production. And that's so startlingly obvious that it's hard to understand why it's never part of the conversation. But mm -hmm. I've kind of digressed here. I want to get back to that kind of final insight that, that came to me through all of this. And that's realizing that there's more to food than just these nutrients we were talking about, whether they're macro or micro or phyto or, or even, you know, RNA based or whatever we're talking about. There's a relational aspect to food that has been, that's probably the most severed part. And what I mean is the average person would not recognize their food in its whole form. And I mean, in its alive, still an organism form. Mm. So this is how I'll usually kind of break this down to people is I'll say, what is food? And then people kind of say a bunch of things and I'll be like, no, let's go deeper. What is food? And I keep pushing on that. And where we eventually end up is, Food is the body parts of creatures. 
Mm. And I define creatures broadly, forms of life. So if you're eating sauerkraut, you're eating cabbage. That's a plant called Brassica oleracea. That's a living creature. And you're eating gazillions of lactobacilli who are creatures who are on there fermenting it, right? If you eat lettuce, you're eating a, a, a plant from the lactuca genus. If you're eating venison, you're eating a deer. And if you're eating poultry, you're probably eating chicken or guinea fowl or turkey or something like that. But these are creatures. But when we eat them now or their body parts or their changed sufficiently through processing that we don't immediately recognize the creature anymore. In fact, you learn really quickly when you start butchering animals, if you haven't been around it your whole life. And I wasn't. So when I first started, this still happens to me today. I'll be breaking, I'll, I'll be approaching something that looks like a beautiful, but dead animal. There's blood. And what happens is, and there's trauma, of course, because animals died by my hands. And so there, the part of the brain that's afraid of our own mortality is engaged immediately. And then the discomfort of being around blood and guts and feces and urine and all of these things that you encounter in this butchering process makes you squeamish. But you keep peeling away and eventually all of a sudden there's this moment where it starts to look like meat. You know, you get the hide off, you get the guts out and really quickly you're like, I recognize that as food. And that's a really cool moment because it goes from being really kind of a turnoff to being like a turn, like suddenly you're like, man, put that on the grill. Mm. So that's a neat thing. And I've got to watch that with a lot of people that I've shared these practices with. Very cool thing. But most of the food we see is already in that state. And so people don't know the animals. So think about how many people who've, and I sometimes forget because I live pretty rurally. So it's very common. People have chickens or turkeys or whatever. But, but for people who've lived in the urban landscape, the built environment their whole life, they may never have seen like a, really been around chickens, but they've eaten them their whole life. This is particularly true of fish. So you think about like who's eaten haddock, but then who's actually ever seen a haddock. Mm -hmm. That's weird. You imagine when has this happened in history that human beings have eaten things that they didn't actually know the well, animal or the I plant. Mean, we, we have a, a generation of kids growing up in, in um, urban environments in the modern Western world, especially the United States, who will eat cold cuts in cold cut sandwiches every day in their school lunchbox and have no idea, literally no idea that that substance came from an animal. Right. Yeah. And, and I, it's important to note, I'm glad you just said that because if it was possible to produce synthetic food, we would be doing that. We have not cracked that code. We may at some point figure out how to make those kind of carbon chains necessary to fuel a human body, but currently we don't know how. We can make synthetic fertilizers, but when you look at truly like draconian level food processing, you still have to, like for instance, 3D printed food, let's say. You still have to start with creatures. Mm. That creature might be wheat, that creature might be barley or corn, or it might be a pig, or it might be a fish, but you start with a creature or multiple creatures and they get refined into these industrialized foods. But at the base of that is a living thing. So I, I sometimes will say this, like um, imagine if you grew up in a small town and you kind of everywhere you go, you go to the hardware store, you go to the supermarket, you go to the post office, you kind of know everybody and everybody knows you. You're in relation with everybody. So day to day, you kind of have this sense of who you are and where you fit in to that community because people know you and you know them. And you don't just know them, but you know, oh, that's so-and-so's cousin. That's so-and-so's mom. Oh, yeah, I remember when Jimmy fell off the tractor back in the, you know, you kind of like have all these stories that fill in all the gaps. There are, isn't these big mysteries of what things are or who, who's who. Now imagine you move from there to a, let's say you move to New York City. Suddenly, it's a lot more threatening of a place because it's like you don't know anyone and nobody knows you. They don't know your stories. And there's all these faces and they're all unfamiliar and you don't know where anything is. You don't know where the resources are. And suddenly, you're kind of lost a little bit. Now, imagine a hunter-gatherer and 
they didn't just grow up in this environment, but they were born to people who'd lived in this environment on this particular piece of land, this landscape for thousands of years. They know every plant, every fungi, every algae. They know every lichen. They know all of the animals. They don't just know them. They know their whole life cycle, when they breed, what their young are like, what their tracks look like. They know the relationships between different animals and different plants, right? The, the ecological knowledge is so deep that it's we, we kind of can't comprehend it today. But deep, deep ecological knowledge, right? So they feel integrated into the environment. They're part of relationally connected to all of these creatures and they are predators. We are predators. So we predate upon these some of these animals and plants, but if we weren't watching, some of them would predate upon us too and they predate on each other. It's just like welcome to earth. That's just the nature of it. But that's okay. And you have stories that you tell that help you to understand why all that is that way. And everything feels copacetic. Now take the average person today and put them into the natural environment. Suddenly they don't know anything. Every plant's just green to them. It's just, we call it the wall of green. Animals, if they even see one, feel threatening. And they probably won't see one because they make too much noise. They don't know how to walk. They don't know how to move through the environment. At night they hear them and they're afraid because they don't know what species they are. Mm -hmm. This is one of the interesting things is even here where I live in Maine, kind of rural, people know the environment a little bit better. But you put them out in a tent at night and they hear all these sounds and they start imagining sort of cryptozoology because they don't know there's only like a there's only probably 20 mammals that live here, you know, like it can only be it's one of those, you know what I mean? But but people start imagining all of this stuff and conjuring all of this horror movie stuff because they're they don't know what's there. They're alien to their own landscape. That to me the food on your plate if it's alien to you then you're out of like relational harmony with the the natural world which does a couple things one it makes those survival shows really interesting because somewhere at the back of the mind is the fear that i don't know how to live in my environment therefore what happens when someone like me is out there oh my god what are the things i need to know right so people like that kind of stuff because they're afraid fundamentally of their own world it also makes them want to develop the world more, more development, more built environment. That's what I know. And I need to be safe here. We need to develop this place to push back that aggressive wall of nature that's always trying to creep in, yeah. right? We want to kind of um, tame everything, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it it means that we don't have any... It means our food could just be cardboard. It could just be flavored cardboard for all we know. It doesn't really matter. It changes when you start to develop. Now, this is true whether you garden or you farm or you hunt or however you do this. When you start to, or you go to the farmer's market and you just meet the people that grow the food, you know, and you start connecting in like with these different species. It's like, what does this thing look like when it's in the ground? Or what's it look like when it's moving across the landscape? That's a really powerful realization. What's a haddock look like? You know, you don't have to necessarily go out and do it. This has like been something I've pursued because my own passion for it. But um, I think it is important that people start to develop some kind of relationship with their food because otherwise we act like an alien species that's landed here. And we don't have any investment in the place. So what, what you end up with, I'll kind of finish with this, is you end up with a whole lot of people talking about how we need to save the planet. We need to save the environment. And it's such BS because they don't even know what the environment is. They don't know what's in that environment. They never go in the environment. They wouldn't know if they spent money on that environment. They wouldn't even know if anything happened because they wouldn't actually see any of that change. And they're, they're very susceptible to being tricked by developers who want to come in and alter the landscape and maybe pay a carbon offset credit somewhere else for some other wetland that they'll also never go to. So I think if we want to like so-called save the planet, we probably need to develop a relationship with that planet because uh, it's like otherwise it's a mostly lip service. And, and with that in mind, there's another layer to that story, which is from the time we're young, we're, we're sort of inculcated with this cultural notion that there's animals yeah and there's humans yeah. humans are above the animals we're separate from the animals 
we're not one of many thousands and thousands of different animal species that exist and have a relationship with nature. We're this separate entity that are humans that's watching above it and interacting it with it. But as, as you said, it's that just that way of thinking about the human species in relationship to nature disrupts our ability to truly be to, to truly understand it and and be in harmony with it in relationship with it such that we could even have the 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 capacity to save it or interact with it in a, in a healthy way to even have the the proper paradigm to understand how it should be cared for yep agreed and and um that worldview that you're talking about is was very uncommon mm -hmm. so most of the people around the world did not have that view um most of the people of the planet had a much more integrated view of humans in nature mm -hmm. and really that worldview was kind of restricted to the domestication center that kind of started in like the Mesopotamia area and moved through kind of Egypt to Greece, to Rome, to England. We kind of follow that historical pattern. So when we, it's changing now, of course, there's a completely new narrative, but for most of us growing up, we didn't learn as much about South American history as we did about Greece and Rome, right? Because we traced our lineage that way. Okay. So that worldview that you just described won out and it won the way somebody cheating, let's say in the Olympics can win. Mm. If they don't get caught, they're willing to do things the other athletes aren't willing to do, they will win, mm -hmm. you know? So we were willing to do stuff that no one else was willing to do. Like we were willing to destroy our own home to get the materials to destroy the next tribe. Mm. We were willing to not just cut the trees we needed, but denude entire forests. Not just find the stone outcropping that we could make our tools from. We were willing to dig giant holes in the earth to get the materials we needed to eventually build all of this technology. So that willingness, it's hard for me to disconnect that willingness from this desire to go to Mars. Mm -hmm. Like, why do we, why do we want to go to Mars? Cause we want to use everything up here and then get to the next one. We're like a, we're like a person with deep emotional wounds and trauma who destroys their relationship and then bails and gets in another relationship. Wow. And we're like, wow, relationship with our mother earth isn't real good. Let's go check out Mars though. <laughs> right. Before we figure out how to live here sustainably, let's go to the next one. Yeah. This is not, it, it's, you don't have to be, you know, uh, like a clinical psychologist to like see what we're doing here. Mm. Right. Um, our willingness to destroy our willingness to pollute our own water to get ahead. Our will, you know, this is stuff that most of the native peoples around the world were not willing to do. And so they fell under the hands of those who were willing to go to those extreme lengths. Mm -hmm. And so that leaves us with this appearance of like, well, we must have been the superior culture. Our ways must be the best ways. And it's like, well, is it? It's like you could get a hundred on that test if you cheat. Yeah. But is that really getting a hundred on the test? I mean, that's kind of like what we've done is we've sort of cheated our way here. And now we're turning around and looking at the wake of destruction, realizing like, uh oh, we maybe we overshot the mark a little bit and things aren't good out in our environment. And suddenly there's this panic. And I love how the I love how the narrative now is that it's your fault, you consumer. <laughs> when it's funny because we were extremely resistant to consumerism. And in fact, um, I don't know how much of the story you know, but like Edward Bernays, the, yeah. the nephew of Freud, came and worked with our government and corporations to figure out how to get us to become consumers. And now they're blaming us and they colluded to get us to buy all this stuff yeah. and all this stuff led to all this pollution. And now it's going to all fall on our shoulders. We're the bad ones who used all this carbon when in fact, none of us really wanted to. We wanted stuff that lasted. We wanted, you know, it's really, it's it's a pretty interesting story that has led us here. Mm -hmm. But um. One thing I'll say that I love about this is philosophical, not practical, because I don't know some I don't see how we could ever get to where like we all go back to a hunter gatherer lifestyle. It's like that's not a realistic thing. But what's really beautiful about that world, that life way is that it um, it's anti hierarchical. 
Uh, so, you know, just so the people listening know this, I know you know it. Um, in hunter gatherer societies, pretty much universally around the world, you just have this idea of individual sovereignty. So while you probably will go along with what your tribe's doing, you're not expected or required to, you could walk out at any time. It's not like here, there was no policing and there was no king. This idea that there was like a chief or this idea of like a, somebody's in charge of the whole village or something, that's stuff that Europeans foisted upon these people because they couldn't understand the way they had this um, decentralization of power to the individual. So many of us now love to imagine a kind of egalitarian world that still has our, all the, when we imagine that here, what we're really imagining is something probably more like brave new world by Huxley. Mm -hmm. It feels decentralized because you're high. It feels decentralized because you have like all the kind of stuff around you. You feel really free in your slavery. Hunter gatherer people had something very different. They had true freedom and sovereignty in a way that most of us will never really be able to understand. Um, but once agriculture was developed, hierarchy immediately comes out of that. This is well established in the anthropological literature. And that's the saddest thing is elites will always drive every civilization into the ground. So I think it's important we ask ourselves, well, what happened to Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, Rome, the, you know, the South American and Mesoamerican civilizations, the Asian civilizations? There was all of these amazing city-states. They rise up, they have power for a time, and then they crumble. And it's always the behavior of the elites that cause that and the greed of people who aren't doing the processing anymore. And they have all those idle hands. Um, and we're watching, we're actually getting to live through that kind of a moment right now. It's actually a very exciting and unique moment in history where we get to be witness to something like that. Yeah. On the, on the note of what you were just saying, what I, what came to my mind is like how we are measuring success. We, we are many modern humans point to sort of our sophistication look at our, these cities we've built and these architectural marvels and, you know, 200 story tall buildings and, and guns and technology and cars and planes and all these things. Look how amazing we are, but we've, as you've said, externalized this harm into so many other areas. And as, as you pointed out, you, I think your words, we've, 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 we look back and we look at this wake of destruction behind us. And uh, it, it depends on how you measure success, right? And like, mm -hmm. we are so disconnected from our relationship to the natural world. We're sitting here building these cities, creating all these technological marvels and doing all these amazing things with technology. And we've never been more disconnected from a harmonious relationship with nature than right now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's amazing to see that, that, that separation. Um, with that in mind, and this, this is something you've kind of alluded to a few times throughout this conversation, there's, there's some research that has looked at hormetic stress, things like exercise, things like inter, um, periods of, of famine or food shortage, um, heat and cold, other types of discomfort, and has actually suggested that the evolution of human intelligence literal brain capacity has largely come about through those pressures of those hormetic stressors. So we, we've evolved these greater intellectual capacities as a way to essentially problem solve, to deal with these kinds of discomforts and, and pressures and unpredictabilities of our environment. And we've, we've successfully solved all of them. We've um, made a lifestyle where we no longer have to exercise to, to get our food or to process our food. We've uh, built, been able to build shelters that protect us from the cold and the heat. We've built air conditioning and we've built heaters and created climate controlled indoor environments. Um, we've created farming. So we have food abundance and refrigerators and we've just one layer after another, how we have as humans removed ourselves from all of the hormetic stressors that have existed for all of human evolution up until very recently, up until this fraction of a second in recent human history. Right, right. 
And what's ironic about it is now we've externalized the harms in all these other areas where now we have epidemics of obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular disease and neurological disease and cancer that are largely due to the deficiencies of those hormetic stressors from our lives. And so now we have to go about this weird process of using our high intelligence to understand this predicament that we're in and go, oh, I need to consciously spend time going to the gym to recreate, as you said, this aspect of ancestral lifestyle. Oh, cold is good. Maybe I should start doing cold plunging. Oh, heat is good. Maybe I should start do going in the sauna. Oh, I sunlight is good. Maybe I'll get some light therapy um, technology, right? And, and we're recreating these different aspects to try to undo the diseases that have emerged from the disconnection from nature and our ancestral way of life. And uh, I, I guess, again, you've kind of alluded to that a couple times in this conversation, aspects of it, but I'm just wondering with that context, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. Everything you just said, I, I lights me up. Um, it's kind of how I started here because I was really in that world of, of, well, I was in, I was in the alternative health world, but the, the idea of biohacking started to emerge. And that was really interesting because that was more computer and tech oriented people. They were like, can I hack myself like a machine? Am I a computer? Can I hack myself? And what they end up arriving at was rewilding under a different name. Yeah. So they started to go, yeah, like, like you just said, for instance, anybody who's ever camped knows no matter where you go, this is true in the desert. This is true in the jungle. This is true everywhere I've ever been. The days are warmer and the nights are colder and there's a sine wave rhythm that moves like this on a 24 and 365 day cycle. But what do we have in our house? A flat line of temperature. Everywhere you walk outside is a sine wave of rippling earth. What's it like inside our built environment? Flat line, right? We've created everything as flat line now. And flat line is a pretty synonymous with being dead. Mm -hmm. And so really, if I could sum up everything you just said, it's like domestication is a degenerative process. So if you domesticate a chicken or a wolf into a dog and you pull it out of nature, you create something different. You know, you do create something more tame and kind, but that thing starts to suffer from disease from being removed from the natural world because all of those hormetic stresses are gone. So we've done that to ourselves. So yeah, it's really funny to me that the people who tried to approach the human body as tech are now the ones pushing sauna, cold plunge, early morning light therapy, and dozens of other things that are all designed to recreate. Even, a lot of them don't even know that's what they're doing. That's yeah, also totally. the, uh, the hilarious most of, irony. Most of them don't. Yeah. They don't. They think they're discovering new stuff. And it's like, oh man, you're just talking about these, these practices are just the life way of people who live outside. So, you know, the idea of inside is like a relatively new idea. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the, the domestication is degenerative. You know this if you breed it, like, like I've known folks who are really into chicken breeding and what they eventually have to do is get guinea fowl. Our chickens come from jungle fowl, sorry, not guinea fowl, jungle fowl from Indonesia. So we've domesticated them into chickens. Well, you end up with enough of those like white chickens running around, getting more and more domesticated as you breed them. Eventually you got to bring in richer stock. So you bring in sort of the way civilizations we're doing that to themselves and then they go conquer some indi indigenous group and breed with them and then they would get a fresh infusion of good wild genetics and now we're sort of out of that and we're dealing with all of these diseases of degeneration and most of us are realizing like the only way to beat these things are recreate feast and famine recreate hot and cold Re i mean literally like put yourself through all so what we're going to end up with is hilarious right we're going to end up with this lifestyle that is truly the hamster on the wheel. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is, and this has been the hardest thing about hunting and gathering, it's land access mm -hmm. and it's pollution and it's um, laws around it too. So it's not easy to do. This is not a sustainable thing everybody can do. I've been really lucky to do this experiment. I, it might not be possible in 20 years. I don't know. I mean, you know, the, most of the world, you couldn't do this anymore. Um, we're very, I'm very blessed to get to do this in the United States, but not, it's not easy. So as we go more and more into what looks to me like some kind of Huxleyan, you know, 
Brave New World meets 1984, depending on where you live in the world, but some kind of dystopia, techno dystopia, there'll be those of us who are trying to recreate these hormetic stresses just so we can be healthy. But it's sad because I do, I do all this too, right? So I, I keep a spreadsheet, Ari, of my, I got, I'm, I'm sure you have some method too, because it's like, I need to get enough saunas in. I did one today. I need to get my cold plunges in. I hate it, but I need to. <laughs> I got to get in my hours of steady state cardio. I've got to get in my strength training sessions. I need to watch the nutrient. All this stuff is so complex to try to track and manage when it, there was a time where you weren't do you didn't have to do any of that. You just played the game of being alive. Yeah. So I think if I was going to sum all this up, it's like I'm a pretty spiritual person and I, I don't subscribe to any religious dogma or anything, but I love the idea of a creator. Um, and I love it for a couple of reasons. I love it. Like, even if it's just a technology, cause I think of it as a technology in some ways, like, because believing that there isn't a higher power puts that power on us and we're bad with that where we suck at that, you know, humility is really important and humbleness is really important. And um, we need a way to cultivate that. So it's why the 12 step programs work for addicts so well, because you, it, it begins with the idea of a higher power and saying, I'm actually powerless against my own self. Like I don't, I don't even have the power to regulate myself. So having a higher power, is really important. I think prayer is really important. And, and I like the idea that we were created and given this world to just live in and it's sort of like a really fun game. You get to just live it. But then we decided we wanted to take control of the game. And we wanted to figure out what the code, how the code was written. And then we wanted to make our own game. And that's what we're doing right now with the genome. And you look at what we're doing with the genome. You look at what we're doing with artificial intelligence. It's like we wanted to find God's tools and the code that he used to build this world and hijack it. And that story is told in so many cultures, but particularly in the Bible, there's the story of um, the Tower of Babel is like this. And the story of the fall of Lucifer is like this. It's the idea that we're not satisfied to just be in this incredible experience and opportunity. We instead want to control it. And so we, we seize the reins but every time we make something new, we create two or three or four cascading negative effects. Then we have to go deal with all those problems, but we create three or four cascading negative effects from those. And that becomes this existential, uh, sorry, exponential problem. And that's what we're in right now where everywhere you look, it's crisis. Mm -hmm. It's crisis in food. It's crisis in tech. It's crisis in government. It's the brink of nuclear war. It's, it's this presidential election we're about to have where you're like really seriously like this is this is really these are the choices like you look around and it's like nothing's making sense anymore because that's what happens when we stop submitting ourselves to a higher power and thinking we are the highest power and then we create this we have incredible technology it's awesome what we've been able to do except the fruits are always bad mm -hmm. so it says in the scriptures like you will know a thing by its fruit. Mm. And so if a tree is good, it'll produce good fruit. But if it's producing bad fruit, it's probably a bad tree. So it's like, similarly, if the fruits of all of this tech that we've developed was goodness, we saw things were getting better, then it would be like, man, full steam ahead. We're on the right track. And, but and, it's and, seemed... and as markers of that, we can look to human health, rates of childhood disease, yeah. Uh, and and um, how many adults have various diseases, as well as rates of happiness or rates of depression, depending on- And rates of them. reproduction would be a good way to look at it too. And I only yeah. say that because, you know, you, before when you were talking about how hunter-gatherers live, I wanted to point out, it's not just, I've seen videos like you were talking about where they're like, the most important thing is meat or the most important thing is food. But there's also a huge emphasis on children and mm -hmm. on the children. And now, you know, I, I know my mom came from nine kids and I have zero kids. And most of my friends have zero to one kid. And I know a couple families with two, three kids. But when you think about how if you don't have at least two children, you're not even replacing yourselves as a couple. You need to have three before you even add one to the population. So the fact that in the place where we have the most wealth and the most opportunity, we are actually suiciding ourselves. 
um, it says a lot about what's really going on here. So we can, we got all the lights and all the flash, you know, cause again, it says Lucifer disguises himself as an angel of light. And we sure have a lot of that light and glitz and glam, but actually fundamentally we're rotting at the core. The, um, the word punk, it, it refers to when the inside of a tree is rotted and it looks like a healthy tree, but it has no core. Uh, we've lost our core and we've become punky inside and everything is that everything around us is degenerating. And so I think we need to get back in touch with real integrity again. Part of that's connecting to the ecosystem. Part of that's restoring our health. And a big part of that is figuring out what this higher power thing is about. And, and, and we're, we're so close to being like, oh, the higher power is chat GPT-4. It's like, no, 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 no. That's a demon in a machine. Uh, we need to point ourselves back to something lasting and something greater than ourselves. Daniel, uh, I have to say you, you are phenomenal. You're uh, just an amazing teacher and someone that I have looked to for a very long time as uh, a great inspiration. I've admired your work. I've appreciated your work. It's inspired me. It's, it's been a big influence on my own thinking. Uh, it's an honor to have this conversation with you after so many years of following your work. So thank you so much for coming on the show and making this happen. And uh, where do you want to send people or, or tell people where they can follow you and, and yeah. learn more from you? Yeah, my show's on Outdoor Channel Monday nights at 7.30. Um, so that's called Wild Fed. Wild-Fed.com is the website. And um, you can find us at wild.fed on Instagram. And you can find me at uh, Daniel Vitalis on Instagram as well. And uh, that's probably the best way to, to get in touch with me. Beautiful. To everybody listening, highly recommend following him. He's one of very few people that I personally follow, and uh, I, I recommend you do the same. So, Daniel, thank you so much. I hope we can have thank another you. conversation sometime Anytime. in the near future. Anytime. This is awesome. great. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.